So we might we might make you a start. Two, I think. Uh, my name's Jonathan Craig. I'm the executive dean of Medicine Public Health. So great to see so many people oh, here me. in the room uh, for the Chalmers Oration 2023, and also uh, those online. Uh, we have. Of course, everybody in the room and online are very important, and it's great to have you all. Uh, but I need to acknowledge uh, some. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Honorary Mark Butler, MP, Minister for Health and Aged Care. I'd like to acknowledge Leanne Little, Director of the Northern Territory Aboriginal Justice Unit, and the privilege to have you as our orator for 2023. Uh, it, and John Chalmers oration wouldn't be complete without John himself, so he's there in the front row. Welcome, John. So great to have you along with Alex and the family. Kerry Freeman, uh, CEO of Salen, critical partner for us. It's great to have you. Mark Butcher, Robin Lawrence, Chief Executive at SA Health. <coughs> Stephen Gerlach, uh, Chancellor. Uh, Brenda Wilson, council member. Welcome you all to what I'm sure will be a fabulous event, uh, not only in the life of the college but the university uh, more generally. Um, and again, I'd like to acknowledge those of you online, particularly those of you uh, up in the Northern Territory. Can I ask uh, Uncle David Copley for welcome to country? Thank you, David. Thank you. Namani, Nayacho Yakandalia, Nayacho Yangandalia, Nainari David Tanda Copley, Yachana Gana, Naiwangandi, Mani Nabudna, Gana Yuta. Basically, Trey Clay, that's hi, how are you, everybody? Welcome, my brothers and sisters. Um, my name is David Tanda Copley. Um, the Tanda is my Aboriginal name, my Aboriginal totem, it means red kangaroo. I'm a Ghana elder and um, I welcome you all to the land of the Ghana people. I'd like to acknowledge here and online all our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander participants and we pay respects to all of our elders past, present and emerging. And the emerging bit's really important because eventually I won't be standing here. And I worked out today, I just walked into a lecture theatre over at FMC where my career started with Flinders and everywhere else in 1986. That's a bit scary. <laughs> First lecture theatre. I think this oration today is really, really, the timing is perfect. We've got a referendum coming up and everybody's talking about it. And I'm not going to tell people how to vote. That's up to their own conscience. But I think the important thing is that it's not about who's ruling government and who's doing that. It's about closing gaps, closing our health gap and closing the huge incarceration gap where three plus per percent of the population is Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander. So enjoy the oration and thank you very much. And once again, welcome to Ghana Country. Thank you so much, David, for your warm welcome and also acknowledgement of what you contribute to us as an institution <coughs> and to our staff and students. Uh, I too would like to acknowledge that we're meeting on the lands of the Ghana people and pay my respects to all elders past, present and emerging and also all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, in the room and online. One of the great things about Flinders, and there are many, is the fact that we work across the traditional lands of very many people, uh, Eastern South Australia, up through Central Corridor, Aranda Country, Larrakia Country, Dagaman, Waterman Country, and out northeast Arnhemain to Yolngu Country. And all of those uh, peoples, they make us all stronger. They make us all stronger because of their Aboriginal strong ways of being and knowing. I'd like to also acknowledge uh, the Minister for coming in particular and acknowledge the leadership that uh, his government has played in terms of uh, courageous discussions about the place of First Nations people in <coughs> this country. And regardless of those uh, outcomes, <coughs> Uh, that, that, that is a very positive conversation for us all. I would, I would ask us uh, all 
uh, when we come to question time that we would remain respectful, acknowledging this diversity of uh, views in the room. And so when we do come to questions, just a reminder that questions typically are one or two sentences, typically are not statements. <laughs> uh, you, you can can't make that, can't a you? statement into a question by a rising intonation at the end <laughs> or a question mark. So these have got to be uh, we're grateful to the Minister and Leanne for taking time to answer questions and we look forward to your participation. Uh, this is how we're going to uh, encourage you all to uh, ask questions. Uh, please, <laughs> you can use that QR code or go to slider, slido.com and enter that hashtag. Uh, type in your questions. But uh, for those of you in the room, we will have roving mics so that we can have questions in real time. So uh, why are we here? Well, each year, Flinders University College of Medicine and Public Health hosts the Chalmers Oration to commemorate the work of John Chalmers, AC, the first professor of medicine, uh, as you can see, who served this community, both clinical and university, for over 20 years. Uh, John was a pioneer, an extraordinary leader, uh, researcher, and educator. And so this opportunity allows us to ensure that legacy of excellence in research and education and clinical care uh, is perpetuated. This year, uh, we are privileged to have Leanne Little as, uh, as our orator. She's a Central Arunda woman and director of the Northern <coughs> Territory Aboriginal Justice Unit. She is uh, a, um, she is a, uh, extraordinary orator, orator uh, with skills, capacity and justice, health, uh, policy and I'm sure we will all leave this room informed and hopefully inspired. But before we <coughs> welcome Leanne to the stage, it's my pleasure to introduce the Honorary Mark Butler, MP, Minister for Health and Aged Care. Uh, Minister Butler has been Member of, the, of Parliament representing the western suburbs of Adelaide since 2007. At that time, he's held the ministries of ageing, mental health, housing, homelessness, social inclusion, climate change, water and the environment. Mm -hmm. And you can see with those uh, portfolios, it's not surprising that he has a particularly strong interest in social accountability, which aligns to uh, what all good universities should have. That's also followed through in terms of his leadership in relation to vaping uh, in the last um, few weeks or in fact months. He's also an author, uh, so he's an academic as well. Uh, author of Advanced Australia, The Politics of Ageing, published in 2018 and Climate Wars, published in 2017. We are delighted that you've joined us, Minister Butler, uh, and we look forward to your comments today. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jonathan, for that uh, kind introduction. You can pick up those books remainded in any <laughs> very cheap bookstore. The only people who bought them were my staff under reasonable direction. <laughs> and my mother, who bought about 30 copies <laughs> of each. <coughs> Can I also thank uh, Uncle David for his warm welcome to country and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging uh, the Ghana people, part of the oldest continuously surviving culture on the face of the planet. And I'll talk a bit more about the referendum later on in my remarks. Uh, can I also acknowledge part of the Chalmers family, uh, John and Alex and Helen and I think Michael left the room when he heard I was talking. Um, a, a number of others, I'm sure, who might be watching online, they're so proud of the contribution their dad made to uh, this place in South Australia, but far beyond, as I'll talk about. Flinders of the 1970s has something of a reputation. Um, it was a hotbed of leftist politics, particularly in the humanities of politics and sociology, with a, a potpourri of Maoists and Leninists and Stalinists and Marxists, all feuding, <coughs> all competing to win the hearts and minds of their impressionable young politics and sociology students. But it was also renowned for its sort of idyllic rural setting, which back then was quite visionary. The decentralised model was 
quite visionary at a time when universities overwhelmingly were situated in the CBDs and its, its focus on science and technology was also part of that reputation, very different to the traditional GO8 universities, including Adelaide down the hill. <clears throat> but another momentous decision it made back in those very early years as a young university was to uh, employ a precocious Wunderkind, still in his 30s, as the Foundation Professor of Medicine, and um, from this uh, long distance in my 50s, um, to take on such a role in your 30s really is quite an extraordinary thing. Um, holding that post, as Jonathan said, for more than 20 years, uh, John Chalmers made an extraordinary impression, not just on this <coughs> university, but far beyond. It's well worth remembering that by the 1980s, much of the levers of health policy in this country were in the hands of two professors of Flinders University. Neil Blewett, undoubtedly, in my view, the best health minister Australia has ever had, uh, and John, who even then, still relatively early in his career, only in his 40s, had risen to a position of very clear leadership in Australia's health and medical research sector. Part of a new generation that was taking the mantle on from that extraordinary generation of post-war medical researchers who are, who are really sort of enshrined in legend um, for Australia very still. There was John, there was John Funder, his great mate, and many others besides. But uh, John was um, clearly becoming the preeminent among them. He had uh, already moved to a position of chairing what we now call RC, or Research Committee, then called Medical Research Committee. He'd assumed positions over time of leadership in the College of Physicians at ASMR, which was becoming increasingly assertive in a good way, I say, but the most significant position he took was to be chair of the NHMRC. And um, at that time, really changed the place of NHMRC in our community, open it up to a much fuller public understanding of its work, but also, importantly, I'm always told as a minister who's had responsibility for NHMRC for four or five years over the past 15, to win more funding. And he won substantial more funding at a time when funding was starting to drop off in that late 70s, early 80s period. Um, I can't count the number of people that I've met over the 15 years I've been involved in one way or another in health policy who count John as one of their key sources of mentoring and inspiration. It's been a constant feature of my time in Parliament, my time in the health portfolio, and I get it because um, my best friend right through my life from the time I was seated next to him. Uh, in the on the first day of high school at Unley High is John's younger son. And for me, in those really impressionable years, he was obviously a bit daunting as a figure of such significance, but constantly patient and constantly reassuring to, to me and to John and the rest of his family and the brood of, of, of young people who collected at their house in, in Air Avenue in Mitchin. And for me, at a very impressionable age, was a beacon uh, of the value of hard work and public service. Almost always, I still remember, seated in his comfy chair out the back, uh, surrounded by papers, no matter what time of the day on the weekend it was, always working, but always happy to take a short break and engage with his kids and their friends. Um, our new chief executive of the NHMRC, Steve Westling, who is also a graduate of this great university, tells me uh, quite regularly that he was happily charting a path to clinical practice as he finished his medical degrees here under John, until John, I think figuratively, not literally, grabbed him by the ear, <laughs> and shook him a bit and said, no, you have to do a PhD. And, and the rest is history with Steve's really quite extraordinary career in medical research over a number of decades, including now taking that important position of leadership at the NHR, NHMRC. Uh, but of course, John's contribution has not just been as a leader in this sector, although significantly it has been. Um, he has played, as Jonathan said, a really important role in research in and of itself, particularly at a, at a globally significant level in the area of hypertension and heart health. Um, and I want to talk just very quickly how significant um, that generation of heart researchers was, because 
John's career, particularly the peak of that career, coincides with a profound shift across the world in management of cardiovascular disease. It's not often well understood, I'm sure it is in this room, but not often well understood that the extraordinary advances in life expectancy that we saw across the, at least the developed countries of the globe from the late 1800s into the post-war period overwhelmingly accrued to infants and children and women, and not so much to adult men. Indeed, the, the additional life expectancy that a 50-year-old man, that is the additional years that a 50-year-old man could look forward to for the rest of their life, in 1970 was only several months more than a 50-year-old man would have looked forward to in 1870, 100 years earlier. A 60-year-old man had essentially no additional life expectancy compared to their equivalent 100 years earlier, and a 70-year-old man in 1970 had less additional life expectancy than a 70-year-old man in 1870, exemplified, I think, by that generation, including my granddads, who survived the Depression, fought in World War II, and then smoked and drank themselves essentially into tragically early graves in those post-war decades. But the 1970s was truly a turning point in that question for particularly adult male cardiovascular health, in part because of some visionary, courageous public health policy, particularly around tobacco control, which, as Jonathan said, we're still fighting, still a fight that, that we haven't entirely won and is presenting new battle lines in, in the case of vaping, but also through the efforts of Cardiovascular, cardiovascular researchers like, like John Chalmers. But as heroic as those efforts um, were and continue to be, we always have to be honest that the rewards of those efforts have not been fairly shared or equitably shared across our community or, frankly, across communities right around the world. And it goes without saying, <clears throat> nowhere is that disparity in health outcome more apparent than for First Nations people in this country. The statistics are depressingly familiar to everyone in this room, and I think increasingly to people right around the country, that with the best of intentions and very, very significant investment over many years, we are just not making any serious inroads into closing the gap. The gap in health outcomes, the gap in life expectancy. Uh, with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people having eight fewer years on average of life to spend with their family and their friends and their loved ones, particularly at that period um, after your busiest years are finished working and raising your own children. And indeed, not only is the gap not closing, but in some very substantial areas it's actually getting worse. Over the last decade, cancer death rates in Australia uh, were reduced by 10 per cent, an extraordinary achievement for the nation as a whole, but they actually went up by 12 per cent for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Daily smoking rates for First Nations Australians are three to four times that of the general community, driving um, obviously extraordinary levels of cardiovascular disease that we haven't seen among the general population for decades, thanks to some of those inroads that I talked about also, uh, earlier. And it's not just the, the disparity in well understood health conditions that we all confront uh, that is depressingly familiar. It's the fact that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people face some health conditions that are essentially unknown in developed countries. Um, rheumatic heart disease was essentially eradicated in developed countries 50 or 60 years ago. Most GPs working in the major cities will never see a case of rheumatic heart disease. But when we go to remote Aboriginal communities, we encounter rates that aren't seen anywhere else on the planet, rates of that disease of grinding poverty and poor environment, terrible housing, uh, rates of that disease that are higher even than sub-Saharan Africa. It's clear to me, I think, to most who think about these challenges uh, a lot that um, a health response in and of itself is not going to fix this. We need um, complex, multi-layered solutions to what are challenges with very complex drivers, very complex drivers indeed. Uh, and that's really why I'm such a strong supporter of this referendum and have been uh, for 
uh, the idea, the concept, not just of constitutional recognition, but a voice to the parliament and importantly to the executive, to the health minister, to the health department for a very long time. It's more than 30 years since the High Court finally swept away that long-standing legal fiction that this was somehow vacant land when Europeans arrived in the late 1700s. Uh, it was a land occupied by maybe as many as a million Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who had been here for 65,000 years, building, as I said earlier, the longest surviving continuous civilisation on the face of the planet. It's why it's so important that we update our founding document to recognise that reality and pay respect to it, but also that we give shape to that symbolic legal recognition, uh, shape through a voice to parliament, an advisory voice to parliament made up of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And I think in health, more than any other area, perhaps, we understand that a good doctor, a good health professional, listens carefully to their patient because it gets better outcomes. It's not just respectful, it delivers better outcomes. And a good and a wise parliament, a good and a wise government, no matter what your political persuasion, should be listening to the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people about issues that particularly impact them, about issues that particularly impact them, as I say, not just for its own sake, as respectful and important as that is, but to get better outcomes. I'm really delighted to introduce um, our orator for this year, Leanne Little, um, who has uh, charted such an extraordinary career uh, from her time as South Australia's first Aboriginal policewoman through really quite a diversity of roles, working with the UN, the RFDS, the Flying Doctors, uh, which she still works with uh, now, the Menzies School of Health Research. She brings a very broad understanding from a health and a justice perspective, which we know need to be um, dovetailed more together than they traditionally have been. Uh, she is, as Jonathan said, now a principal driver behind the Northern Territory's uh, justice agreement and different approach to the challenge of incarceration. And uh, I'm really looking forward to her address today, and we're all incredibly grateful, Leanne, for you coming down to South Australia and agreeing to be the 2023 Chalmers Orator. Thank Please you. welcome Leanne. Thanks for that. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and John Chalmers and family members in whose honour we hold this oration. I want to thank you, Minister Butler, for your kind introduction, but I'm honoured to be here today to deliver this year's John Chalmers oration. I'd also like to acknowledge my twin sister, who's in the room here, Lynette Little. I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm on the lands of the Ghana Nation and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I stand here today as a proud alumnus of Flinders University, having enrolled as a mature age student in 2001, graduating with an honours degree in law in 2006. The views I present today are my own. I also use in my talk names of people who have passed. As an Aboriginal woman with several university degrees, I'm acutely aware that I'm among only 10% of Indigenous Australians aged 20 to 64 with a university degree. Compare that to 35% of the general population and we would all agree that that is something that we would like to change. Indigenous Australians are in crisis. Now, what do I mean by that statement? Our children are born with poorer health, higher infant mortality, and our people die much younger than non-Indigenous Australians often the result of preventable diseases that only exist in third world countries. And we have one of the highest youth suicide rates in the world. And it doesn't stop there. Indigenous Australians are 10 times more likely to be incarcerated with the health and wellbeing of Indigenous prison populations considerably worse than the general prison population. 
And as some of you may be aware, my first career for over a decade was in policing, which brought me into contact with countless offenders, those at risk of offending, and many victims of crime. I later qualified as a scientist, and much, much later as a lawyer, where I now work for the Northern Territory's Justice Department as the director of the Aboriginal Justice Unit. And in this role, I spent the last few years travelling to all corners of the Territory, where I visited diverse communities, where I met and talked with local people about the many challenges that they are facing. And here's what I found. Our struggles are not new. Poverty, family breakdown, physical and mental health, ill health, substance abuse, inadequate and overcrowded housing. Again and again, I heard that Indigenous people in communities had been promised so-called solutions from multiple levels and all persuasions of government, which have almost always failed to deliver any real improvement in the quality of our lives or future prospects. Billions of dollars have been expended each year in the bid to close the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. But one critical factor has long been missing, accountability. Not just from us as Indigenous people, but from every Australian, you and me, and most importantly, from all levels of government and the service providers they fund. Now that is inexcusable and must change if we're to have any hope of closing the gap across a broad range of measures not just in the areas of health and justice. I'll expect that we'll hear more about closing the gap as the nation's refer na national referendum on an Indigenous voice to parliament approaches. The referendum should cause us all to seek more information about what we don't know. But we are often told, if you don't know, don't find out, or words to that effect. I'm often asked whether I think the voice will make a transformative just difference in our lives as Indigenous people. And the truth is, I don't know. The debate over the referendum has been unedifying, often toxic and misinformed. However, many Australians for the very first time are having a serious national conversation about the rights of our nation's first inhabitants to have greater control of our lives, our children's and our grandchildren's futures and destinies. And that's both good and necessary. I want people to listen and think and talk more about how we close the gap that is looking more and more like a chasm. To expand the solutions beyond reconciliation action plans or Indigenous employment strategies, or frameworks, or guidelines for, well, just about almost everything. I want people to understand that learning about and interacting successfully with Indigenous people demands much more than attending a cultural awareness session, or reading a book, or buying an Indigenous painting to hang on your office wall. Instead, one must learn by listening and investing in a genuine partnership with us. Because we must do this if we are to close the gap. We want you to think both how and why we must make a difference that matters and achieves the results to effectively address the current levels of disadvantage and disparity experienced by so many Indigenous Australians. Without a doubt, the wants and needs of Indigenous people has been overlooked, discounted and ignored for generations by those in power. But who are those people in power? It is everyone who sits in a room where decisions are made that impact directly or indirectly on Indigenous peoples' 
where too often we, as the Indigenous people, either aren't in that room, or if we are, we remain a small minority, largely to legitimate these exercises in non-Indigenous power. Where our worth is only seen to be limited to cultural or Indigenous issues. Where the funding decisions are made by the people who assume and convince themselves and others that they know what's best for us as Indigenous people. Well, I'm here to tell you that they don't, because if they did, Indigenous people would not be among the most disadvantaged, unhealthy and incarcerated populations worldwide. While many millions of words will be spoken both for and against the voice, I will believe it will be an abject failure of process should this national conversation peter out after the referendum. Regardless of the referendum result, the gap will remain and widen even more unless we all do more. We must see all levels of government and their agents, including those in health professions, demonstrate genuine transparency and accountability for policies, programs and procedures for all Aboriginal people. We need to target the spending on Indigenous Australians so that we get exactly what's needed, where it's needed the most. But to achieve this, it must be recognised that, that at present, Indigenous people have little control of the levers that can shift the status quo and work our way out of poverty and disadvantage. Yet we continue to be held responsible for the many failures that aren't ours to own. With dominant discourses being of deficit and dysfunction running rampant throughout. While the new Closing the Gap Agreement, in partnership with the Coalition of the Peaks, enacted in 2020, has seen some real progress in funding service delivery through Indigenous controlled community organisations, that progress is still slow, uneven and hard because of dual accountabilities of Indigenous organisations. For decades, the only accountability that mattered to governments was the acquittal of funds according to contracts and, our, our, and accountability upwards to those in power. The complex accountabilities of community and regional bodies to the very Indigenous people they represented were ignored. These dual accountabilities will continue and are legitimate, especially the accountabilities downwards. If only governments and government agencies and the non-Indigenous service providers they still generously fund recognised and respected their downward accountabilities. Starting out as a national Indigenous health equ equality campaign, Closing the Gap was a response to the Social Justice Report 2005 by Professor Tom Karma. That report highlight the factors underlying significant health inequality in Australia, where he challenged the governments to bring parity in these areas within a generation. Adopted as government policy in December 2007, the Council of Australian Government set measurable targets to improve health and life expectancy for Indigenous people over the following decade. And then in 2018, when the 10th annual Closing the Gap Progress Report was released, it was obvious that a majority of the targets were not on track. Importantly, the target to close the gap in life expectancy by 2031 was not on track. And while there was some improvement in Indigenous morbidity and mortality rates, particularly from infections and chronic diseases, including circulatory disease, non-Indigenous morbidity and mortality improved, maintaining the gap. But the mortality rate for non-Indigenous children under the age of five declined at a faster rate than for Aboriginal children. In fact, the comparative gap 
actually doubled. In 2020, a refreshed national agreement on closing the gap was signed by all governments and the coalition of peak Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations, where they set 17 new socio-economic targets. Now we had targets for health and wellbeing, education and employment, including justice, safety, housing, land and waters and languages. It made sense to broaden the scope of the agreement to tackle the subject matter of health and justice, or perhaps I should say health injustice, as they were so closely linked it's astonishing that it was not included in the original agreement. But more about that later. I'm pleased, pleased to note that the national agreement on closing the gap is being independently reviewed every three years by the Productivity Commission, which will continue to provide an analysis of progress against the priority reforms, targets, indicators and trajectories. However, progress continues to be slow, where there are only four of the 17 targets that are on track to be met. This terrible progress against goals is reminiscent of the failure to fully implement most of the 339 recommendations of the 1991 Royal Commission into Aboriginal, Aboriginal Deaths in Custody report, some 30 years later, and yet, another lost opportunity to close the gap. The original Closing the Gap Agreement set a limited range of socioeconomic targets. The 2020 Agreement not only expanded those targets, it added four priority reform areas that were basic to the fundamental need to change the way governments work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, organisations and communities. Those priority reform areas are to establish more formal decision making between governments and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, to strengthen the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community controlled sector, to transform government entities to be more responsive in achieving the desired outcomes, and finally, to share relevant data. In 2023, the Productivity Commission reported that, and I quote, although there are pockets of good practice, overall progress against the priority reforms has been slow, uncoordinated and piecemeal. Despite over 2,000 initiatives being listed in government's first implementation plans for closing the gap, many of these reflect what governments have been doing for many years. Actions often focus on the what, with little detail on the why or the how. There is, for the most part, no strategic approach that explains and provides evidence for how the initiatives that government have identified will achieve the fundamental transformation envisaged in the agreement. The report also warns that stronger accountability mechanisms are needed to drive change, as said in this statement. Existing mechanisms lack bite. They are not sufficiently independent, do not contain timely and appropriate consequences for failure, they obscure the individual's responsibilities of each party, and are not informed by higher quality evaluation. This finding underpins my conviction that no transformative process can be made without real obligations to monitor and evaluate service delivery against contracts and real transparency and accountability measures. And the most pressing part of those accountabilities is downwards accountability to the Indigenous communities, as I've argued before. Not only are these obligations missing or unfulfilled, 
But that failure also denies government and government agencies access to the vital expertise held by Indigenous communities and Indigenous community controlled organisations in their planning and implementation. So let's revisit the underlying factors that perpetuate poor Indigenous health outcomes. Only two of the 17 national agreement on closing the gap targets specifically address health outcomes. But as Michael Mamont showed, the others are all social determinants of health and illness. According to the 2018 Australian Burden of Disease Study, the leading contributors to burden for Indigenous Australians were cardiovascular diseases such as coronary heart disease and rheumatic heart disease, mental and substance use disorders such as anxiety, depression, alcohol and drug use, injuries such as falls, violence, road traffic injuries and suicide, cancer and musculoskeletal conditions such as back pain and osteoarthritis. This same report found that during, during 2018, Indigenous Australians lost 240,000 years of healthy life due to ill health and premature death. According to the Royal Flying Doctors Service recently report, released report, Best for the Bush, people living in remote and very remote areas are 4.1 times more likely to die from a heart condition, stroke or vascular disease. With remote Indigenous populations, 1.8 times more likely to be hospitalised and die from a heart condition, stroke or vascular disease. Now that's not surprising when you consider the risk factors associated with these serious conditions that are found at higher rates in Indigenous areas, such as high blood pressure and cholesterol, poorer diets, lower rates of physical activity and higher rates of obesity, higher rates of smoking and problem drinking. These risk factors, I should stress, can be managed quite effectively through primary health care initiatives. But do most Indigenous people have access to basic human health care? Well, according to the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Survey, the proportion of Indigenous Australians living in very remote areas with a locally available doctor is around 36%. Now that's a stark contrast, contrast to the 95% of Indigenous Australians with GP access living in major cities. Now given what we know about the role that accessible, appropriate, quality and timely healthcare plays in improving health outcomes, it is a tragedy that in 2023, this is still being denied to the Indigenous people and communities who need it the most. When it comes to meeting the needs of all Australians, particularly Indigenous Australians in remote communities, our healthcare system falls short. Now you might think that the answer to the issue may require more aircraft or more specialists to access patients, but sure, yeah, that, that is one of the factors, but only one of the factors but it is irrelevant if other factors aren't also present as outlined in these next few experiences that I, explain, that I um, share with you. Apatula, or Fink, is about 300 kilometres south of Alice Springs. It's home to about 200 Aboriginal people. Well, 93% of them are Aboriginal, but it's a young population where more than 60% are aged 34 years or younger. Only a handful of Aboriginal people are employed because most live on welfare. 
The only store in the town is owned and operated by an Aboriginal controlled organisation where prices are high and choices poor. Now, the last time that I was there, I bought 500 grams of mints, frozen. It cost me $50. 9% of locals in Fink have diabetes. Now, that's twice the national prevalence. Diabetes, as you all know, is a serious illness that can, especially if poorly managed, lead to other complications, including kidney disease, heart disease, vision loss and amputations. The local health clinic at Fink opens its doors from Monday to Friday, 8am to 5pm, and it's staffed by registered nurses and Aboriginal health workers. There is no permanent GP on staff, but one visits from out of town, and specialists including women's health and midwifery dental, hearing and mental health professionals attend the clinic from time to time in a fly-in, fly-out day basis. Women are required to travel to Alice Springs, 100 kilometres away to give birth. In the case of an emergency, the Royal Flying Doctor Service is there. Now, this scenario is, scenario is so typical for so many remote Indigenous communities across our vast nation. And then there's another in Wilcania, in the far northwest of New South Wales, that was recently singled out during a New South Wales government inquiry into health and hospital services in rural, regional and remote parts of the state. Now, during that inquiry, the Wilcania Aboriginal Lands Council chairman provided a devastating insight into the experiences of residents when trying to seek life-saving health care. Now, despite the town being serviced by three separate health organisations, the nearest dialysis unit was 200 kilometres away. The chairman shared the story of one local welder, a woman in her 80s who was suffering kidney failure, who was travelling close to 5,000 kilometres a month to receive dialysis treatment three times a week. For an Indigenous person, connection to country is the essence of life. And forcing elders to travel far away from home can be both mentally and spiritually heartbreaking as they become disconnected from their country. It was, as the chairperson said, probably killing her just as much as the actual disease. And because health care is still not being provided on a just and equitable basis, the current system exacerbates disadvantage and condemns many Aboriginal people to shorten lives marred by poor health. I recall on one of my visits, of which I did 120 visits to remote communities, for the NT Aboriginal Justice Agreement. An elderly man told us that only a few days before we got there that he had experienced chest pains. So he went to the medical clinic nearby where he rang the after hours bell. But instead of being ushered through and triaged as one might expect, he was told by the medical staff there to go home as it wasn't an emergency. So he did just that but he returned the next day to show the same nurse the sign out the front on the fence of that clinic that clearly stated that chest pains were considered an emergency. Now, when he showed this evidence to that staff member, the clinic staff said nothing. And we made a complaint on his behalf only to be told that it was contracted agency staff who were to blame. So when we spoke to this man afterwards, instead of being angry that he'd been denied treatment as would be his right, he simply said this, that he was very sad that this nurse, who had been there for years, was on his land and in his community, and yet he was powerless to hold anyone to account because there were no consequences 
for the failures. Now let me tell you about another tragic incident. Dougie Hampson, he presented to the Dubbo Hospital in 2021 with an elevated heart rate and tearing and popping sensations in his stomach. His family says a father of eight wasn't evaluated properly. There was no examination, no x-rays or scans, and he too was sent home. He died less than 24 hours later from perforated ulcers, and his death is now the subject of a coronial examination. These are far from isolated cases, and there are many others who haven't survived failures of such duties of care that are evidenced and etched on headstones in, in cemeteries or their names are read out aloud in coronial inquiries across the nation. Somehow, the avalanche of red flags were missed, but in reality, they were ignored. Where coronial recommendations are left unimplemented, unaudited, without accountability and without consequences for those responsible for those failures. In June 2023, a Queensland cor coroner found a public hospital failed in their care of three young Indigenous women who died from preventable heart conditions. The inquest, triggered by an ABC Four Corners investigation, found the women known as Kaya, Betty and Mrs Sandy had all died from complications with rheumatic heart disease in 2019 and 2020. The inquest was told that the women were often sent home from the hospital with some Panadol, a shut up pill, as one family member described it, despite them presenting with serious symptoms, including fever and elevated heart rates. In her 134-page report released in July, Coroner Nerida Wilson was damning of the local Doomadji Hospital, describing poor record-keeping, unacceptable follow-up care and racial stereotyping. Now, while physical access is certainly one reason Indigenous people are not receiving adequate health care, it is obvious that there are other factors at play. And this brings me to a subject that makes many Australians feel deeply uncomfortable. But it is an important one because it also happens to be a key determinant for poor health and poor justice outcomes for Indigenous Australians. It's a subject that's often denied and defended by many, and that's racism in all its forms. A lot of people have trouble accepting that racism accepts in the 21st century Australia because they think, I'm not a racist person. I don't judge people by the colour of their skin. I don't call people racist names and I'm not violent towards them. Many might even be able to identify an act of racism perpetuated by an individual and would likely condemn it. But while the Dumaji case shows Stereotypes and unfair treatment by individuals matter. They may not be the most critical factor of race, form of racism in causing disastrous health and justice outcomes, because that is systemic racism. Now, what is systemic racism? Systemic racism refers to the way in which racist beliefs or values have been built into the operations of institutions that discriminate against controlling or oppression or oppressed minority groups. Systemic racism operates regardless of the conscious intentions of staff. Where there is no recognition of social, cultural and historical differences that re results in the standard practice being inadequate and is therefore much harder to identify. Often, it is just the way we see, define and do things. And it sits within policies, operating as business as usual, often unquestioned, unaddressed and unchallenged. That is until something bad happens 
or someone in power is brave enough to raise it. Now, many of you would agree that the level of professionalism and care that was provided at Jumuji Hospital clearly fails any standard of care. And dozens of rigorous scientific studies have shown that the treatment of many Indigenous people in remote clinics in hospitals and rural and urban centres and even in health research is routinely substandard. But what we can't do is scapegoat individual staff and we can't call for more training to fix it. Failure to conduct routine examinations and ensure adequate care is a system's responsibility held by line managers and ultimately senior managers and accreditation bodies. When I stand here and say that an undercurrent of racism across our social institutions is harming and killing Indigenous people, well, it's not just my opinion because it was identified by Professor Karma in 2005 when he noted the inequality in health status and life expectancy endured, endured by Indigenous people caused by systemic discrimination over many decades. The Royal Australian College of General Practitioners also acknowledges that racism, including systemic racism, is a fundamental cause of poor Indigenous health outcomes. So how does systemic or institutional racism manifest itself? Well, consider that 13% of all patients receiving dialysis in Australia are Indigenous. And yet Aboriginal patients are 10 times less likely than non-Aboriginal patients to be added to the waiting list for a kidney transplant. Now, according to the Kidney Health Australia, about 30 of 800 kidney transplants performed each year are received by Indigenous Australians. And while there are valid reasons why some Indigenous Australians might not be suitable for transplant patients, such as core comorbidities or organ availability in some areas, Several experts have questioned as to what degree is the gap fuelled by racism. Indigenous Australians also tend to wait much longer for elective surgery. And as I mentioned before, we are more likely to be turned away from a hospital emergency department than non-Indigenous Australians. Several of the 99 coronial inquests and deaths that were associated with the Royal Commission into the Aboriginal Deaths in Custody some 30 years ago found that very ill Aboriginal people presenting at hospitals were presumed to be drunk, only to be placed into police custody where they later died. There is also considerable evidence that stereotyping and uncertainty about the capacity and willingness of Indigenous patients to comply with a particular treatment influences some doctors' decisions on whether a treatment is offered or not. In a national survey of Indigenous patients, 32.4% reported racial discrimination in medical set settings most or all the time. Repeated experiences of racism has a profound impact on individuals adversely affecting their physical and mental health and undermining confidence in institutions and systems. It erodes the trust that Indigenous Australians have in doctors, police, schools and other service providers and it reduces the likelihood that they will engage with that service ever again. Witnesses to the 2002 New South Wales Rural, Regional and Remote Healthcare Inquiry described to the committee the impact of discrimination on whether to seek treatment. They said, they were not going to the hospital because of the way they are treated because of the colour of their skin. They will not go to the hospital because they are left in their beds for days without even having their sheets changed. And no Aboriginal health workers have visited them. 
Other people said, I actually had a client of mine a couple of days ago say to me that she would not go back to the hospital because she is sure if she turned up unconscious, they would she think that she had overdosed. She hasn't used it eight years, but she actually had a missed heart attack because she was put in the waiting room and seen as a malingerer. Some Aboriginal people feel that some of the staff in the hospital emergency uh, treatment rooms do not treat them well. Some people felt uncomfortable and judged and that they were discriminated against. And there is a feeling that people's medical problems are regarded as self-inflicted due to drug addiction issues and the like. And some Aboriginal people or more Reeve feel staff at the hospital are dismissive and do not take their concerns seriously. The fact that most health services across this country are not sensitive to the needs of Aboriginal Australians is yet another barrier to equitable health care. I'm aware of one Northern Territory community where Aboriginal men said they wouldn't attend the local health clinic staffed by a lone female practitioner. Why? Because it's culturally inappropriate to see a woman about men's health issues. Many healthcare providers have little to no understanding of the importance of Indigenous knowledge, values, beliefs and cultural needs when making decisions about treatment. Care and cultural safety for each person needs to be informed by gender, kinship, family ties, language barriers, socioeconomic issues and intergenerational trauma. For example, consider how the spectre of the stolen generation or the NT intervention might play into a young Indigenous mother's reluctance to seek help for a drug or substance issue or for support from, from a violent partner. Studies carried out internationally have identified a strong association between experiences of racism and poor physical and mental health and risk-taking behaviours such as substance misuse. Research by our own Australian National University, analysing data from more than 8,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander adults, found that those that had experienced discrimination had poorer outcomes and wellbeing. And that was regardless of their age, or where they lived, or what their gender was. So when we consider the path from racism to poor health, it's not too difficult to imagine the pathway from poor health to prison. Imagine an individual who has given up on ever receiving appropriate care or treatment for a serious health concern. Due to, due to the impacts of their illness, they might struggle to hold down a job and an income to provide for themselves and their family or keep a, even a roof over their head. Compounding psychological distress can increase the likelihood this individual will engage in negative coping behaviours, such as high risk alcohol or drug use, which in turn, we know, raises their chances of contact with the criminal justice system. So it's of no surprise that our prison population is highly vulnerable. People who spend time in prison experience higher rates of homelessness, unemployment, mental health disorders, chronic physical disease, communicable diseases, tobacco smoking, high risk alcohol consumption and illicit use of drugs than the general population. And as I said before, Indigenous peoples are significantly overrepresented in Australia's criminal justice system. According to the ABS, close to one in three Australian prisoners are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. In the Northern Territory, it's higher still, with Aboriginal men representing 78% of the total adult population, where Indigenous children are overrepresented again in the criminal justice system to an even greater extent than their parents comprising, on a good day, 
of the youth detention population. Around a third of Australia's entire prison population has a chronic physical health condition such as arthritis, asthma, cancer, cardiovascular disease or diabetes. Mental health is even more of a concern. A 2008 Queensland study involving 419 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander prisoners detected mental health disorders in 73% of those male prisoners and 86% of female prisoners. Substance use disorders were the most common, detected in 66% of male and 69% of female prisoners who typically reported other mental health disorders too, such as anxiety, depression, and psychotic disorders. The study also found that 12% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander male prisoners and 32% of Aboriginal female prisoners had post-traumatic stress disorders. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, or FASD as it's commonly known, has had a devastating impact on the lives of many Indigenous Australians, and it's played a major part in elevated prison rates, especially in the young population. The cognitive disorder, which is a result of prenatal exposure to alcohol, is associated with deve developmental delays and difficulties regulating behaviour. It results in impaired decision-making and impulse control communication difficulties, poor memory and attentiveness, and an inability to predict outcomes or understand consequences of one's actions. The Royal Commission into the Protection and the Detention of Children in the Northern Territory found that many of the young people in the Northern Territory's youth justice system exhibited symptoms of FASD, including more than half of the 16 children who gave evidence on their experiences. And meanwhile, an Australian Senate inquiry found that Australia-wide <coughs> FASD affected young people 19 times more likely, at a rate of 19 times more likely, which made them at risk of being incarcerated. Unfortunately, these types of cognitive impairments frequently go unrecognised by police, courts, prisons and detention facilities. And as a result, the offenders go undiagnosed, untreated and unsupported, leaving them more likely to re-offend. Hearing loss is another prevalent issue affecting Indigenous Australians, including those in prison. An estimated 90% of Aboriginal children in the NT under the age of three have suffered an ear infection or disease capable of producing hearing loss that affects early brain and language development. There is some evidence that the prevalence of hearing loss among Aboriginal prisoners in the NT could be as high as 80 or 90 per cent. And back in 2015, the Australian Medical Association, they drew the connection between Indigenous health and the prison gap, describing the high rates of imprisonment as sym symptomatic of the health gap. It is possible to isolate particular health issues such as mental health conditions, substance abuse disorders and cognitive disabilities as the most significant drivers of the imprisonment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and target them as health issues as part of an integrated approach to also reduce imprisonment rates. I couldn't agree more. The AMA also stated that the situation was compounded by a health system and a prison health system, that despite significant improvements over the past decades, they remained unable to respond appropriately to the needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander prisoners. And as I stand here today in 2023, nothing much has changed. And if you are after more proof that we're going about this the wrong way. Look to Wellington 
in New South Wales, a community with significant health and social issues and a high Indigenous population and an ageing population too. Now this region has two prisons, the Wellington Correctional Centre and the Macquarie Correctional Centre, who both cater for maximum security prisoners. And yet town residents regularly have to wait up to two to three weeks to see a doctor at the local medical centre. Prisons are expensive and they're not particularly effective when it comes to rehabilitating offenders or helping them get well and change their behaviours so they're less likely to offend again. Australian taxpayers, you and me, spend more than $5 billion each year, more than $330 per prisoner per day, incarcerating those who break the law. Recidivism rates are high, particularly for Indigenous prisoners. And between 2012 and 2018, more than 60% of released Indigenous prisoners returned to prison within two years. So that's six out of every 10 people that go into prison, they'll come back to jail within two years. Now the reasons are complex, but they lack, there also is a lack of effective, effective support during incarceration and immediately after, including culturally appropriate drug and alcohol rehabilitation. As a nation, we must let go of the delusion that prisons fix crime, because they don't. They do nothing to address the complex underlying social factors that contribute to a person's offending. And we know that time spent in prison makes it more, not less likely that an individual will re-offend. Now I want you to think about this. If a health service or a product was to increase the likelihood of a person becoming sicker, no doubt about it, it would be withdrawn and taken off the market. So you tell me why we are so accepting of a prison system that does more harm than good. The refreshed national agreement on closing the gap seeks to reverse the overrepresentation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander adults and children in the criminal justice system. It is targeting a 50% reduction in the adult rate of incarceration and a 30% reduction in youth held in detention by 2031. That's not that far away, people. And while this is one target that is still headed in the wrong direction, I believe great strides will be made when we start to treat the health and imprisonment gaps as an integrated issue. When governments start to work with, and I mean really work with, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community controlled sector to deliver the services that people need and when our accountability mechanisms are given some bite. And when we do this, we might just make some progress towards closing the gap. Proper accountability means actions linked to outcomes, clear independent measures to evaluate progress and real consequences when expectations are not met. If you can do this as an individual, if you, sorry, if you can't do this as an individual or as a medical service provider, then feel free to move on, go get another job, because you have no business cashing in on that check from the taxpayer. I hold great hope for the community of Madangrida, about 500 kilometres east of Darwin, which two years ago took control of its health service from government after pushing for the change for several decades. The Malala Health Service Aboriginal Corporation now oversees 
all its primary health care and has improved services provided to the community via expanded programs and the promotion of preventative and targeted care. It employs over 200 staff, and more than half of those staff are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. There are four doctors, which, ins which ensures continuity for community members, as well as a full-time pharmacist at the clinic. An adult dental program is now running an additional 20 weeks per year, and a new proactive program tackling rheumatic heart disease has been rolled out. Other services include physiotherapy, nutrition, women's health and midwifery, breast screening, men's health, diabetes education, cardiac education, podiatry, paediatrics and mental health. A mobile laundry van visits camps around the community and gives families free access to washing machines and dryers, playing a vital, vital role in preventing and treating diseases. That same organisation is also responsible for youth diversion and early intervention, bush camps and drug and alcohol programs. Meanwhile, a local law and justice group is overseeing an alternative approach to dealing with offending and they will soon receive a community court. This, my friends, is what it looks like to empower a community to take the steps it needs to improve outcomes and enrich lives. When Aboriginal people feel that they have been heard, when their specific needs are being met, and when they feel respected and supported rather than judged or looked down upon, they can thrive. There can be a new way of doing business with new partnerships where Aboriginal people can lead. Community leaders can hold outsiders accountable for their lack of service delivery, poor performance and professionalism where outcomes are not met. Mandatory Abor Aboriginal representation in governance structures can ensure financial and quality control and independent auditing. But the fundamental question remains, will the rest of Australia sit up and take notice and listen to our voices? Because we cannot afford to die waiting. Thank you. I think we'd all agree that those of us in the room uh, or online have been privileged to hear not only an oration, uh, but a call to accountability, regardless of where we sit in this health system. And that irrespective of our role, we all have a critical part to play. So we've got time for a few questions and given uh, to leaders of this country, it's important that we uh, open it up to the floor and online via Slido. So, Minister, if you're able just to um, come up and have a seat here, and also Leanne, uh, and there are uh, mics there. So, we'll now. I'll just turn myself off. Pardon? I'll just turn myself yeah. off. Okay. So, uh, is there anybody? In the room, uh, we've got some roving mics for any questions that people might have for either the Minister or Leanne, uh, and we'll probably go for about five or ten minutes. I can't believe there are no questions. 
I, I might make a start then. I mean, a Minister, you've heard an extraordinary oration, not only in terms of the issues that have confronted us, but certainly some opportunities for, for change and the sort of control, Aboriginal control, that would be instrumental. Do you have it, do, would you like to reflect on any uh, thoughts from uh, hearing Leanne? Well, well there, are, there are so many. I want to congratulate Leanne on that address. It was, um, it was powerful. It was, it was um, incredibly well informed. Uh, and I think it, 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 uh, it presents the challenge of finding uh, examples where things are working and giving them scale a and um, you know, having a, a level of discipline and accountability, as Leanne describes it, at government and across health services to learn from what is working and scale that up right across the country. Uh, community control is, has, has a really terrific history in health with more than five decades of the community controlled model working right across the country, but there are still far too many services delivered to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people by non-Indigenous organisations. One of the very early commitments in the implementation plan as Leanne pointed to, was to transfer those services over time to community control. It's certainly a discipline we're trying to work through in the health portfolio, um, as I've asked every single service to, to be subject to an audit about why it's not subject to community control. It's something the NTG is doing, uh, shifting their government services to community control because we know it delivers better, better outcomes. Um, but the, <coughs> the, the, the challenge I referred to in my earlier remarks as a health minister and as a health department is finding ways to connect to other areas of policy, to whether it's justice or housing uh, or employment, to um, have a complex response to complex challenges. Uh, I was talking to um, a number of the community controlled organisations in the Territory when I was up there over the last couple of days. And one of them was saying two communities that they support, one of the Aboriginal medical services up there, uh, was saying one of the communities has an average of two to three people per house, another has an average of 18 people per house. Well, it's no surprise um, that the health outcomes in those two communities are profoundly different. Now, we can provide health service responses to that. We can provide more echocardiograms where there's rheumatic heart disease. But at its core, this is a housing challenge. Uh, there are employment challenges and justice challenges. So that, I think, is always the, the challenge of government, not working in silos and, and developing cross-government responses to some of these incredibly complex solutions. But the message that I took out from Leanne's more than, more than anything was the message of accountability and building accountability right through the system, including to community controlled organisations, to non-Indigenous health organisations and importantly to government as well. There's a question online to Leanne. Um, how do we go from being well-meaning supporters to genuine and powerful advocates for change? Um, I think everyone has a role to play in this, no matter what um, sector that they work in. I respectfully disagree that uh, the issues in Aboriginal communities are complex and challenging because I think language matters and they're not complex. What we're asking for is a standard of care and uh, a, a, a quality of care that meets our needs as Aboriginal people, where we feel confident, when we do feel sick, we can access health care. And whenever I go into a boardroom or wherever I go into meetings with government, that word of complex and challenging and uh, repeats itself over and over again. And I think we can do better and we should do better. And we've got the templates from those Aboriginal controlled organisations to showcase us how to get there. I think what needs to happen is that in many ways government has to let go of the reins and allow Aboriginal people to lead and trust that we know what we're doing in this space. 
with the same levels of accountability, if not more, if you want them for Aboriginal controlled organisations. And I think that's when we'll see a difference in Aboriginal people's um, health and wellbeing and, and more, we'll see less people in the criminal justice system. But I think f to move the average Australian, what role can they play? Really start to ask some of the questions, why and how can I participate and what can I do in my capacity to assist you to be the best person you can and to make sure your children, you know, the next generation doesn't suffer the consequences of the last. There's so many people out there that can write to ministers, can ask questions of ministers and those people who are currently holding all the power and the levers that make the decisions that impact on us that will change the current status quo. Uh, Minister, there's a question online for you. Accountability of governments has traditionally been elections. Should the concept of ministerial responsibility include an individual or departmental KPI or report? Well, I mean, I think it does still. Uh, you know, the, the, the major accountability mechanism we've had uh, for the Closing the Gap strategy since it was adopted as government policy in late 2008 has been the annual report to Parliament. Uh, but, but I think as important as that is and um, should be maintained, what we are trying to do in government is to de develop much more granular accountability mechanisms, portfolio by portfolio. I, I instance the, the, the long-standing commitment, which largely has been honoured in the breach, frankly, to transfer uh, services for Indigenous Australians to Indigenous Australians, um, you know, we are now working under the leadership of Minister Burney to much more granular account accountability mechanisms across all departments to, to report to us as individual ministers and then to Linda and to the PM about how we're going with those. Um, you know, I've found services that are very long standing for, for decades exclusively for Indigenous Australians in the health portfolio that have been delivered for all of those decades by um, non-Indigenous organisations with no plan to transition them. In spite of, uh, as Leanne said, um, a very clear evidence base that, that community controlled services deliver better outcomes. So uh, I think there is a, a different level of accountability being worked up uh, under Minister Burney's leadership, um, but you know, I think as important as the annual report to Parliament should be, we do need a more granular level of reporting and accountability. Thank you. We might go to, for the last question to the Chancellor, given that he's in his, he's retiring, um, and it's only appropriate that, that we go to him for the last question. I appreciate that online and in the room, there are, th this is, these are critical debates. Uh, and so we can only start to unpack uh, these issues. So, Chancellor, and then we will need to close. Thank you. Um, always the last word <laughs> is a reflection of uh, <laughs> my time at Flinders, no doubt. Um, I'd just like to say to Leanne, um, it was a very, very thought-provoking speech that you made. Um, it dealt with a number of different issues that I think we all really do need to focus around and understand better. Um, I just had two, two, two comments. Um, it seemed to me that the whole question of accountability is something that a lot of us have talked about, where it sits and what's happened to it and all that stuff sort of thing. But the other side of that is that I think um, most of us have known that we need to let Aboriginal and Indigenous people run the show where they have to or can, and want to, and we have to trust them. So the other side of um, accountability is also that it's up to us to trust <laughs> 
the people that want to do them and back them to do it. And everything I've heard suggests that they will and can. Um, but it's the old saying, if you don't give someone a go, then you will never know. And it's what we stand for in a lot, lot of things, but I think that we have tended to um, think it's our responsibility to look after them totally, which is really not the case. And the other comment that I wanted to make so, was... So, uh, Chancellor, far be it from me, but, <laughs> but can we just go to Leanne to, sure. to respond and then we might need to draw it to a close? You can. So, I think um, people, need, people need to understand that Aboriginal control doesn't mean that we exclude non-Aboriginal people or from uh, health services. Like, w we welcome researchers and uh, all, every element that we know sits out there to partner with us and come on board on the journey to improve our, our, our outcomes and more. Some Aboriginal controlled organisations may not be ready to transition, but we have so few that uh, have um, been given that opportunity that I think uh, th there's so many good examples out there um, that we need to look at those and, 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 and replicate those across the nation because I, I honestly believe unless we partner and broker in and bring people like philanthropists in, such as the Paul Ramsey Foundation, who you know I work heavily with, um, we've got to bring everyone with all the levels of expertise that we need. If you, people want stronger governance over the system, better monitoring and evaluation. I mean, I've seen so many contracts in systems that talk and measure uh, things like how many barbecues were done, how many people turned up at your meetings, um, all those sort of KPIs, but they never went back to the Aboriginal people and said, did we meet your needs? And if we didn't, how can we improve? I rarely get asked by any service provider that I use, could we have improved our service to you better? I usually have to lodge that as a complaint. And that's a tragedy because I should be able to have a system that doesn't make me feel like I'm always the problem and always lodging complaints. So, so uh, we will need to bring it to a close there. And the reason is that uh, actually there is a major activity that's happening in the Northern Territory. Uh, 1.30, which is a couple of minutes uh, prior, uh, where we've got voice to parliament facilitated by uh, Prof Professor Kalinda Griffiths, our Poach Director, and Professor Simone Locateur uh, around a voice to parliament education session with elders uh, on campus across the Northern Territory. So please join me in thanking uh, Minister Butler, Leanne Little for what I think has been an extraordinary and transformative event. Thank you. Thank you.